This is BBC Learning Zone. Hello and welcome to tonight's programmes. When mortgage rates fluctuate in this country, house prices become a little unstable. Tonight's OU compares the housing market in Britain to Germany's and discusses the differences. In secondary schools programmes at two, the human body comes under the microscope, from conception to old age. There's more from the German soap at four. Nico faces yet more challenges as he struggles to get to grips with the language and culture of Germany. School improvement through international partnership is part of the Working in Education Hour from five. And then back with the OU at six with a look at the Age of Enlightenment. An enlightening experience from BBC Learning Zone. The pattern of all markets is rise and fall, boom and bust, if you like. The housing market is that kind of market that as prices rise, more people join it. As prices fall, more people step out of it. And that tends to enhance the boom and bust cycle. You can see the housing market generally in Britain as, as being one of a lottery, where what you bought, where you bought, and when you bought determines the losses and the gains you make. The Building Societies Association have done a, a large number of surveys every couple of years, which have always tended to show that something like 80% of households in Britain want to become homeowners and the other 20% were dismissed as oddities. Housing. Something we all talk about and worry about. Whether you live in public rented accommodation, in private rented property or in your own house, that roof over our heads is a constant topic of conversation. We're going to look at the UK housing market and compare it with that of Germany. In the UK, people are used to very high levels of home ownership, whereas a high proportion of Germans live in rented accommodation. So the tenure patterns in the two countries are different. We're going to start in the UK, where home ownership is clearly a high priority. The rented sector has declined in the post-war period, and now about 70% of people live in homes that they own. There was an enormous uh, baby boom in 46, 47, 48, and basically that whole group hit the home ownership market in the early 70s, and they r effectively raised uh, demand by, some people would say, 35 to 40 percent. Um, and if, needless to say, that had an enormous impact on, uh, on prices. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. I suppose we should start with the election of the government in 1979. Conservative government arrived with a very strong commitment to promote home ownership, perfectly prepared to back that with substantial assistance in the form of mortgage tax relief, and to institute a policy, the right to buy for council houses, which meant that lots of people in public sector tenancies could then move into home ownership. Those, if you like, underlying fundamentals then were added to in the mid 1980s by a deregulation of the housing finance market. So alongside increased demand, you had then increased supply of funds. The two together obviously produced the cocktail of a considerable growth in home ownership and house prices. So the UK market has seen a swing towards home ownership. Nevertheless, there is still a significant private rented sector. Many people can't afford to own a home and others make a conscious decision to rent. Kevin McIntyre rents a house near Bristol. Certainly for me, it's a, a temporary, temporary thing. I wouldn't like to um, go on renting for, you know, a long, long time. I think, you know, I was doing that while I was at college, and that was fine, and I, that was appropriate then to rent. Um, I wanted to spend some time somewhere first before I decided where I wanted to live. So it's not, uh, it's not wasted money. It, it certainly, it's obviously not not lining my pockets, but um, uh, it's whichever way it goes, I'd still be paying someone, whether it's a mortgage or, or whether, it's, uh, whether it's a landlord, I'm still paying someone to, for the privilege of living in a house. I'd like to buy in, in the future. Um, well, it looks start looking perhaps at, at summer time, so that'd be a year or maybe 18 months. Um, so coming Christmas, we shall see though, I'm not, not sure yet. 
cheaper in the long run. That's that's one thing. Um, it's more expensive to rent than it is to to actually own a house. Um, and I suppose I like the idea of eventually having a place that is 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 yours, is your own. Um, so I'm quite keen on that. It is a good investment, I feel, to to actually end up buying a house uh, because it's settled more, I think, rather than actually knowing that someone else owns your house. Um, it's actually your own house and, and you're responsible for it. Hi, Patrick. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Oh, not too bad. Good, good. Kevin's landlord is Patrick Whitehouse, who became a homeowner at the age of 22. I always saw renting as money basically lying in somebody else's pocket. I wanted to buy with a view, obviously, t to stay in here sort of indefinitely. Um, I just saw renting as b basically uh, as dead money. And, and there's always obviously the, the worry that once you're settled, that you'll have to move out for whatever reason. I didn't look at it as an investment as in to make money. I looked at it as, well, it'll be mine in the future. You know, that was, that was the only reason I bought really. So that when I retired, that I'd, I'd have a house to live in. I, wouldn't, you know, I didn't have to continue to pay rent, you know. Bradley Stoke was somewhere where I'd worked on building sites. Biggest new town in sort of Europe. There was like offers here, there and everywhere. A new house as well, no work other than a bit of painting and decorating, you know, no fear of it sort of disappearing down a hole into the ground. So that's the reason I chose Bradley Stoke really. It was incredibly easy really. Uh, you know, at the time, I sort of, most 21, 22 year olds, I never had a penny sort of to my name. I was um, had a girlfriend at the time, which when we decided we were going to move into the house, she had a reasonable job, you know, like I don't forget, it was like fourteen thousand a year, something like that. Um, we came to look at this house or look down this road. Just initially, it was just you know just to see what what was going on down here. And within sort of like that, we looked at the place. The lady in the sales office was like, oh, she said, oh, brilliant, you know where. Uh, you know, you'll love this area, oh, it's, it's really developing, it's a great place to live, and, and it was just like, 100% mortgages available, no problem. For most of the post-war period, the 60s and the 70s and most of the 80s, buying a house in Britain was seen to be a virtually riskless activity. Throughout the 1980s, in particular, people felt a need to get on the housing bandwagon. Basically, you know, that prices were going up at the time, and uh, there was pressure, like, I think, oh, better buy before it um, go up too expensive. One Sunday, literally, I just went up to have a look, and I uh, saw the house, and I thought, this looks OK. Uh, but it was only a plot, so, the, you know, the saleswoman said it won't be ready until August. But she said, if you liked it, then you have to um, uh, put a deposit down. So I said, well, I need to sort my finances first. And she goes, well, if you don't put it down, put your deposit down now, it'll be sold tomorrow. So, you know, lucky I had my checkbook with me, so I a check for £200, which wasn't refundable either if it you know, didn't go ahead. And uh, I had to exchange in five weeks as well. And if it didn't, the price would go up another 5000 That's how bad it was then. The German housing market experienced none of this price boom. Prices rose with inflation, but inflation was low and stable. Only about 40% of Germans live in homes that they own, and there is a much larger rented sector than in the UK. The main difference to the British tenure system is probably that um, we have a large rental sector in Germany um, as a, compared to the owner-occupied sector. In the early 70s, the owner-occupied sector was roughly 35% of the whole housing sector. And that increased slowly but steadily to roughly 40% towards the beginning of the 90s. Buying a house in Germany is an expensive business, and very few young Germans own their homes. Home ownership is popular with older Germans, but young people nearly always rent. As in Deutschland, is this... In Germany, it is most likely that when you buy a property, you also plan to live in it for a relatively long time. But when you're young and your lifestyle hasn't yet established itself fully yet, then you think about moving here and there, maybe because of your job or for other reasons. And because of this, I believe that the renting tradition is particularly popular amongst the young people in Germany, 
because you quite simply don't want to commit yourself living in a flat or a house for a long period of time when you're young. In einer Wohnung lange zu bleiben oder in einem Haus lange zu bleiben. Also wir wohnen jetzt hier. We've been living in our rented flat for 10 years now and have never yet had the opportunity to buy something. That doesn't have an awful lot to do with any future plans that we might have. It's always been a financial problem, one of buying in Germany. Buying has never been an option for us. As a person who rents a flat, you're in a much better legal position in Germany. So your rights as a tenant are um, very much stronger than is the case in, in England. Unser Mietvertrag is our tenancy agreement cannot really be cancelled, well, it's hardly possible. We would have to stop paying the rent, or only pay part of it, and then it's just possible that we might be thrown out. The law in Germany at the moment, which is a regular topic on the news, is rather more on the side of the tenant. That means that it's not at all easy for a landlord to get tenants out. If you pay the rent on time and treat the flat in the way it's meant to be treated, then the landlord hardly has any grounds to throw you out. What also makes a major difference between the English and the German market is that most of these flats are empty. They are unfurnished and they have a neutral decor. So it's, it's not this problem that you have to live with the, the books or the vases or the, the wallpaper from your, from your owner, but usually the vast majority of flats are unfurnished, neutrally decorated, and this makes it also more attractive to go to a, a rented flat because it, it's open to your own um, wishes and, and, and specifications. We've already been living here for 10 years and we'll perhaps live here for another five years, so do we really want to stare at blank walls and a hole or the like? It's simply one of those things. You want to make it as cozy as you can, even if you are only renting. If we do decide to buy something, then I think we all agree on this. It won't be in Berlin. We'd rather move to the countryside, but that is rather difficult at the moment due to work. We're quite tied down in this respect. We'll have to wait and see what the future brings. So the jump from renting to home ownership is a big one for Germans. There are very few 100% mortgages and banks expect at least 20% deposits before they will lend. Jean-Pierre Müller and Marianne Flemich have been renting a flat in Zeilendorf, an affluent suburb of Berlin. I wasn't able to, to afford a, a house to buy or a flat to buy. It was far too expensive. I had no money to um, to give to the bank because you have to pay a certain amount first. You have to have a certain amount of money, um, about 20% of uh, the whole amount you need for a flat or a house. And I never had this. We both um, studied and when you study, most of the, the Germans, they study until they are uh, 28 or about that, yeah? sometimes 30. Uh, and then they they can start in life and then they have to uh, have another 10 years for saving money if there is nothing from the parents. So it takes a lot of time to have the money. Here in Berlin uh, I rented because it was not very clear if I stay in Berlin or not and after four years I know I will stay so we um, looked for a house and finally we bought it. Today, Jean-Pierre and Mariana are moving. They have finally bought a house. It's only a few streets away, but for them it's a big move. I think to, to live in uh, your own house is something different. It's, it's, it makes something, yeah, to be sure, to be grounded, to be, to be in, a, in a place where you belong to. Very we happy. are so happy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nice, beautiful. <laughs> The sun was shining in the morning when we moved and uh, everything is nice. 
Yeah, so we are very happy here. Well, we financed it in the usual way, if I may say so, 20% our, our own capital and the other 80% bank loans. Uh, so we went from one bank to the other and asked everyone how are your conditions and at least we found a very good uh, one and with uh, very good conditions and so we, we made the contract. Yeah. To reach the 20% deposit needed to buy a house, young people are encouraged to save through organized and structured savings schemes. I think uh, the difference between Britain and Germany is that in, in Britain you can buy a house easily, relative compared to Germany, where you, in, in Germany you have to accumulate to save and you have to live through a certain period to show you are a very responsible person. You are able to cope with money, you are able to cope with debts and so on. And this is very important for, for the banks before they give you a loan. I've, I've tried it, well, for several months, but then I took the money away and uh, <laughs> bought something for it. <laughs> and so I never, I never was able to save money. Um, uh, but uh, I tried it, yes. Uh, and it's, it's a quite good way if you uh, are able to save money. Yeah? And uh, many people, they say, if you have such a... Uh, a contract um, then the bank sees that you are able to to work with the money yeah usually people move into home ownership when they have settled and so that's basically their last move in, in, in many cases so they need this down payment and they they do not really have any intent mo most of them don't have any intentions of selling the house later at a higher price and move to a even more comfortable house or things like that that's quite uncertain. the tradition in, in Germany was that you buy a house or build a house for your own purpose and it it was never the case that there was a big market for sailed houses so you have you you, you buy a house for your own purpose and you sell it if you move of other reasons than of speculating on the housing market this is not very common in, in Germany. I hope it will go with the inflation, but to really um, to win something, to make a big deal, I don't think it's possible. But I'm 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 happy with with it like that because I would like to live in. It's not <laughs> it's not the reason why I, I buy a house because I I don't have the intention to become rich. <laughs> so there is no expectation of boom, but is there any fear of bust? Unification and other factors have put the German economy under pressure, leading to feelings of uncertainty for some borrowers. It's of course, the, there is a danger to, to lose a job or something like that, and then it will become hard, of course, but um, I'm an optimist, so I don't think <laughs> that re there will be uh, something in this uh, in this direction. If you are not optimist, you, you can't move, you know, <laughs> then uh, nothing happens. Yeah. So we just said, okay, we, we jump into the water and we will see what happens. I'm so much around in my life. Uh, I'm happy to be here. That's in this very moment the, the major point. So I don't think that in within 10 years I will move from here. <laughs> So the German housing market is essentially stable. By contrast, the UK market is more volatile. It flourished through the 1980s, but then came problems. Here, the boom in house prices is over, according to the Halifax Building Society. It says prices rose by about a third this year, but next year they're likely to go up only 5%. Up until the late 1980s, home ownership was seen as a more or less inevitable safe economic bet. Uh, it, you could never say, as with stock market investments, the value of your investment may fall or it will rise. It was more a question of it may rise rapidly or it may rise slowly or sometimes it will mark time, but it never fell. 
And what happened from late 1988 is the value of your investment fell, and it fell, of course, very markedly. The downturn really started with a whole variety of uh, factors, huge increase in interest rates, a withdrawal of some of the uh, elements of tax relief, which meant that demand was overstimulated, which triggered much of the boom, and then, of course, by the time it was then withdrawn, in a sense, you'd taken some demand out. So a combination of rising interest rates, uh, booming demand, and then its withdrawal, uh, and, and just generally the downturn into the recession with rising unemployment meant that you had a lot of people overcommitted, and in a sense the whole market began to feed downwards. A survey by Britain's largest building society shows that house prices are falling across southern England. In many parts of the country, builders are slashing prices to sell new homes, and many first-time buyers are getting cheap start mortgage deals. Nowhere were the effects of the recession felt more than in estates such as Bradley Stoke. We're in Bradley Stoke, which is about, about eight miles out of Bristol, and it, uh, it purports to be, and probably is, the largest new housing estate in Europe, and that's how it was built when it was, uh, when it was first developed. It began to be developed in the mid-80s, 1986, very much an estate catering for homeowners, young homeowners uh, who are moving out of Bristol or moving from other areas uh, adjacent to Bristol. Because of when these estates were developed, and it, uh, that's true of estates elsewhere, the, they are inevitably full of people who moved 1986, 87, into the late 1980s at a time when the market went from boom to uh, higher periods of house price inflation and finally into collapse. So they're full of people who have experienced common problems. Uh, the concentrations of people affected by boom and bust. So in that sense, they, they've been affected by problems elsewhere in the market to a much more, to a much more concentrated degree. So uh, issues like negative equity, very much associated with places like Bradley Stoke. I and mean, Bradley Stoke was seen as the, the, the negative equity capital of, of this part of the country, certainly. House prices fell faster last year than ever before, according to a survey by the Nationwide Anglia Building Society. The average value of homes dropped by over 10%. We had a house which, when we bought it, was like 56,000. There was a quibble when we bought it. They wanted 58, and they, the, you know, the building society said, no, house prices are dropping, house prices are dropping. And I should have seen that as a writing on the wall, really. But uh, we managed to get the place for 56. They, you know, the, the builders dropped the price. But then it continued to just drop and drop and drop. And within no time, it was really at, the pre at, at its present sort of level. By 1994, Patrick's house, like many in the area, was worth less than £43,000. I could say with confidence, you know, you might think that this is a, a, a huge exaggeration, but uh, there's about 12 houses within this cul-de-sac. Uh, I guess nine have been repossessed. And that is, that's no, you know, that's no exaggeration. This is a place of young families. And it's also a place, inevitably perhaps these days, of, of high divorce. Yeah, families do split up. Now, divorce always causes problems, but in a situation of negative equity, the problems are amplified. So you get difficulties of people being able to sell the house, you have people staying together for longer, so you get problems that won't go away so easily. And what I'm really suggesting is that even if the housing market begins to pick up, for people in that sort of situation, for example, the problems don't go away overnight. There are, there are effects that will linger on despite any increase in house prices. I'm no longer with the, the partner that I bought the house with. Um, obviously, that's unfortunate to the point that I, I need to sell the house now because, I, because I'm, you know, I'm sort of remarried and, and we can't sell it. Um, my ex-wife still owns half the property like five years after we split up. Uh, and from her point of view, I mean, she doesn't want she doesn't want this place any more than I than I do. You know, at least I had the benefit of living in here for a while because she moved moved away. Like, um, it's just a major headache. So, how had the '80s boom been fueled? Were the lenders themselves responsible for the soaring prices? One of the things which did characterise the period in the early '80s is the mortgage lending market was liberalized and a large number of new lenders were getting into the market and were trying to get a slice of the action. And consequently, whereas the building societies had traditionally had really very strict 
uh, quite conservative mortgage lending criteria. You could not buy, borrow more than two and a half times your annual income. Uh, only one time the second earner's salary would be taken into account if that. Uh, all of that went by the by in the early 80s as there was uh, almost a gadarene rush to lend to, to build market share and you, at that period in the mid 80s you could borrow four times your annual income i heard reports of five times and clearly lenders did if you like join in the general optimism that this was a market moving forward and that therefore there were products to supply money to be lent and they did so but that's very much following what consumers wanted if you like pressure and from government too that here we had a huge political pressure a huge consumer pressure to expand home ownership lenders in a sense responded now exactly how you allocate the blame in that i think is a rather difficult process government's own research says that lenders were certainly not responsible for the boom i agree with you they were a part of the boom but they're not if you like solely responsible for it in the short term the recession in the housing market made people think more carefully about investing in property. But the general attitude to home ownership has not changed. Surprisingly, still very positive. The short-term attitudes, however, are subject to change quite clearly. Although there's that long-held belief that people want to be homeowners, the short-term attitudes have been subject to fluctuation that clear the recession had a major impact and you could see that people's uh, attitude to home ownership became more negative during the recession. People didn't think it was such a good idea. More people opted to say they prefer to rent. While attitudes have remained, I think, relatively uncontaminated by the housing market collapse, there's a core, a hard core of people who are going to be left in a situation where even if they still see home ownership as the best investment for the future and the housing form they want, it's going to be a long time before they can escape a difficult problem that they found themselves in and may well find themselves taking a more cautious attitude towards investment in the future. My attitude is, and would always would be to be honest with you, that you're better off owning something than obviously renting something. Um, the, obviously, I wouldn't want to, what happened to me first time with this property to happen all over again I, I can't see it happening now there's, there's you know i understand obviously because of what's happened with this one the way the way that things work now and i can't i can't see it sort of our house price now dipping again the house that we've got now but uh obviously um i'm just very disappointed in the way things have worked out with this with this house House prices went up at a faster rate last year than at any time since the 1980s, according to Britain's biggest mortgage lender. The Halifax Building Society says prices rose by more than 8% and predicts that there will be further increases in 1997. What then does the future hold? In Germany, the percentage of homeowners increases, but slowly, and the market remains essentially stable. The UK market, with its cycles of boom and bust, has left some homeowners with burnt fingers. I've spent a lot of time in the last four or five years sitting in financial advisors' offices, sitting it, you know, in the mortgage, uh, in the lender's office, dis discussing like what, what I'm going to do with this place in the future. And uh, they've all said the same thing, you know, that, that house prices, yeah, they'll move, but um, the government now keeps public spending in, in check. They will not allow it to happen again. Um, I, I can't see it. I'd be surprised if this is, house is worth what I paid for it in the next 10 years. I think it's going to be business as usual, frankly. It's, uh, the, the lenders, uh, uh, not so long ago, were saying, well, we're not going to lend uh, so much uh, to, um, to people. We're not going to lend 100% loans. We're going to be more cautious. But already we're seeing 100% loans back on the agenda. We're seeing high multiples of, li high multiples of income. We've seen evidence again in, in our research here that uh, people are able to borrow fairly substantial sums of money to get out of the situation they found themselves in. So, with, again, with, with financial deregulation, there's so much pressure, so much competition in the financial sector to lend, I think it's uh, going to be back to, back to business as usual in the future.
For more details about the Open University, you can ring us on 01908 653 231. There's an American tale with a difference now on BBC Learning Zone as members of the Japanese-American community in Los Angeles describe their experiences. <laughs> 